Welcome to this comprehensive guide teaching you how to take pictures of the Aurora. I will be covering all aspects of the process, including planning, gear selection, and camera settings. In the description of the video, I have created timestamps so you can navigate between different sections of this guide. To start out, what is the Aurora? The Aurora is a natural phenomenon created by the interaction of solar wind with gases in the upper atmosphere. The solar wind is funneled toward the Earth's poles, creating two auroral ovals, one around the northern pole, corresponding with Aurora Borealis, and one around the south pole, corresponding with Aurora Australis. While Earth's poles are typically regarded as inhospitable regions, major tourist hotspots like Alaska, Iceland, and Scandinavia are located in this oval and experience spectacular aurora in the long nights of winter. Sometimes, due to various factors in the solar wind, the aurora ovals that are usually situated close to the poles move toward middle latitudes, and periods of enhanced geomagnetic activity can bring aurora down to the continental United States and United Kingdom, or up to New Zealand and Australia. These periods of increased geomagnetic activity can be forecasted, but besides a general forecast, Predicting the aurora down to the hour or minute is hard to do without advanced knowledge of solar wind data and trends. If you do see an aurora forecast, look for the KP measurement, which is a scale used to roughly measure the geomagnetic activity of our planet. Higher KP numbers correlate with more intense aurora and greater expansion of the aurora ovals, so knowing what KP you need to see aurora at your location will help you decide when a good time is to head out and photograph the lights. Besides strong geomagnetic activity, weather and light pollution will dictate when and where you photograph the aurora. Since the aurora takes place hundreds of kilometers above us in Earth's atmosphere, any type of cloud cover will obscure the phenomena. Keeping tabs on the weather should become customary if you want to capture the aurora. But cloud cover is not the only element that can ruin aurora photos. Enter the world of light pollution. Light pollution, just like air pollution, can be found over cities and can completely obscure even the brightest of stars, let alone wispy aurora. Try to find an area with low light pollution using a light pollution map. Check the urban areas in the direction you will be shooting as well, as aurora will often remain on the horizon, sharing space with light pollution from distant cities. How about gear? The two main gear items you will need are a camera with manual exposure and a lens with a large aperture. DSLR, mirrorless, bridge, and even some smartphone cameras all allow you to adjust shutter speed, ISO, and aperture separately. An essential feature to have since cameras struggle to calculate correct exposure in difficult lighting. A lens with a large aperture will be better for aurora photography as well, since increasing the size of the aperture will allow more light to pass through the lens. Aperture is measured in f-stops, with smaller values corresponding with larger aperture sizes and larger values corresponding with smaller aperture sizes. For aurora photography, a lens with a maximum aperture of f2.8 or lower is ideal. Having a large aperture lens along with a wide-angle field of view is the best setup, since shorter focal lengths will capture more of the scene and allow for longer shutter speeds without star trailing. Besides a camera and lens, a sturdy tripod is absolutely essential to minimize camera shake. Even pressing the shutter button can cause internal vibrations throughout the camera, so having a shutter release cable will eliminate this worry. If you want to record time-lapse, buy a shutter release with an intervalometer function. For Aurora photography, dialing in the correct camera settings can be tricky. Using a camera with a manual setting means you have control of three parameters, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. Let's talk about all three in depth. Shutter speed is the length of time the camera sensor is exposed to incoming light. Longer shutter speeds expose the sensor for longer, increasing the exposure of the image. Since aurora is very faint, the shutter must be kept open for a long time, sometimes as long as 30 seconds. However, two factors limit the time we can open the shutter, the movement of the sky and the aurora itself. Since the Earth rotates, our stationary position on its surface makes the sky appear to move across the sky. This movement can be detected when using long shutter speeds, and round stars can deform into unpleasant streaks. To find the longest shutter speed without experiencing star trailing, 
we use something called the 500 rule. The 500 rule is a formula which takes 500 divided by the focal length of the lens, which, if you are using a crop sensor camera, will need to be multiplied by a scaler to get your desired shutter speeds in seconds. While the 500 rule will work for most situations, high megapixel cameras will see star trailing, so a 400 or 300 rule may be in order. But what about the second factor, the aurora itself? Under intense auroral activity, shutter speeds calculated using one of the aforementioned rules may blur complex and quickly shifting structures, leaving the aurora as a blob. Decreasing shutter speed can help preserve the detail, making the aurora more defined. So then, a general rule of thumb for setting shutter speed would be to always start at your maximum calculated shutter speed and trying shorter and shorter shutter speeds until the aurora is as defined as you would like. Aperture, like shutter speed, determines the amount of light the camera receives and has its own rules and techniques. Typically, when shooting any nightscape, it is commonplace to set the aperture to its largest setting. This will transmit as much light as possible into your camera and will allow you to use shorter shutter speeds. This strategy does have its disadvantages, however, because most lenses exhibit some aberrations when used at their widest apertures. Stopping down by one stop corrects these aberrations in most cases. ISO is a principle of photography, often misunderstood. Amongst the photography community, two misconceptions derived from the days of film cloud the true implications of ISO in photography. The first misconception is that ISO is the sensitivity of the image sensor, and the second is the higher ISO values cause more grain in images. These statements were true in the days of film, when the sensitivity of the image strip was determined by physical light-sensitive silver halide crystals, appearing as grain once developed. Grain in digital photos can be primarily attributed to a lack of exposure, either from using shorter shutter speeds or smaller apertures. To exemplify this, I took three separate photos, leaving ISO and aperture the same throughout the three, but cutting shutter speed in half, from 20 seconds to 10 seconds and finally to five. I brighten the last two images by one and two stops, respectively. Zooming in at 100%, it's clear noise increases as shutter speed decreases. And conducting the same test while only decreasing aperture size, the same results are realized. So then what does ISO really do? Increasing ISO does three things. It increases the brightness, decreases the dynamic range, and decreases tonal range of an image. So, then should you lower your ISO all the way and brighten the image in post-production? On some cameras, this strategy is effective, but on others, lowering ISO and brightening in post can reveal unappealing fixed pattern noise and strange artifacts. I suggest you become familiar with the ISO behavior of your camera before trying these methods. If you are still confused, I will provide links to helpful websites in the description. Besides shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, other settings should be changed when taking photos of the aurora. First, change the focus mode on your camera or lens to manual focus. To focus on the stars, either turn the lens focus ring all the way to infinity, or for more precise focus, enable live view on the zoom button. Pick a bright star and move the focus ring until the star becomes sharp. Make sure white balance is set manually, especially if you are shooting a time lapse. This will prevent the camera from changing the white balance in between shots. Also, make sure that you shoot in RAW image format instead of default JPEG format. RAW files allow for non-destructive editing and easier recovery of blown highlights and crushed shadows. Now that you have knowledge of the planning, gear, and settings needed to take pictures of the aurora, you should be well on your way to creating beautiful photographs of one of the greatest spectacles on Earth. Subscribe to Apple Apps and hit the bell icon to be notified of my future photography animations. Make sure to rate the video and feel free to leave a comment. As always, thank you for watching.